In the fight against the coronavirus, there is still one big unknown. How many people have actually contracted it, maybe even without showing any symptoms? One way to answer the question is by antibody tests. An antibody is a protective protein produced by the immune system to destroy, for example, harmful viruses. When a pathogen enters the human body, the immune system recognizes it and produces antibodies that dock onto the pathogen's antigens to remove them. Later, a test can be used to detect these antibodies in a person's bloodstream. Now, antibodies are also used in vaccines to make people immune to future infections. But immunity doesn't always last a lifetime. So what do we know about SARS-CoV-2? And how long will people be immune after an infection? These will be some of our topics on this edition of COVID-19 Special here on DW News. I'm Chris Colbert in Berlin. Welcome to the program. Now, in the quest to fight the coronavirus, a small town in Germany could provide valuable answers. Heinsberg, in the state of North Rhine-Westphalia, has become an epicenter of the current health crisis. Now, scientists are using the town as a testing ground to find out how COVID-19 has spread and how to move forward. The streets are empty in Heinsberg. The town on Germany's western border with Holland has become the epicenter of the coronavirus crisis in the country. It was here that the virus spread at a local carnival, infecting dozens of citizens and putting the town in the focus of politicians and virologists alike. Heinsberg offers a unique opportunity to us because the virus arrived here on a very specific date, on February 14 or 15, during Carnival. Based on this, we have sufficient data, for example, to determine unrecorded cases. Heinsberg has become a case study for COVID-19 and the question, how can we go back to normal? A lot depends on how patients develop immunity to COVID-19 through antibodies. To find out, mouth swabs and blood tests were conducted on 1,000 locals. 15% of the population of the municipality here can no longer be infected with SARS-CoV-2. There has been some criticism that the study might not be representative of other regions. Also, some experts fear it might be too early to say whether or not antibodies prevent further infections with coronavirus. We'll talk to a leading scientist here in a moment if, and if so, how the search for antibodies can help the fight against COVID-19. First, a quick reminder what exactly we mean when we talk about antibodies. Now, antibodies are produced by the immune system to neutralize pathogens. When, for example, a virus enters the body, the immune system produces specific antibodies that dock onto the virus's antigens to remove it. Now, these antibodies can be detected in a person's bloodstream later on. So let's take a closer look at the matter with Gérard Krause. He's a professor of epidemiology at the Helmholtz Center for Infection Research. It's good to have you on the program. Um, does finding antibodies mean that the pathogen has been eliminated, that the infection is over? Not necessarily, no. Uh, antibodies just reflect the fact that the immune system has had contact with the pathogen. And often it also reflects that later on, after the disease has been passed, has been uh, overcome, that then the uh, body is immune, at least for a certain time, against new infection. Hmm. So how does detecting these antibodies help us against the fight uh, against the coronavirus here? Okay, so this helps at multiple levels, at population level and also at individual level. So at population level, if we know how many percent of the population do have antibodies, we do also know that those people will not be able to transmit and be part of the duplication and transmission process of the epidemic anymore. So this helps in assessing what kind of measures we need to do. It also helps us in determining how many percent of the cases that we are counting do actually exist 
And that in turn helps us to assess how many cases are dying in proportion to the cases that actually exist. So all those figures are very important for the assessment of the risk of the epidemic, but also for the assessment of the strategies to fight against the pandemic. Hmm. Now, some experts say the that these, these antibody tests uh, don't deliver accurate enough results that antibodies against other forms of corona coronavirus get detected and then get mistaken. This is correct. This is a big difficulty that we have. So, so far, the currently available antibody tests have some cross-reactivity reaction to the, um, uh, to the other coronaviruses. And it is difficult to assess how large this, this failure or this percentage actually is. Um, we hope that in the future, and actually my lab is working on that, new antibody tests will be available that will be more precise and more specific. Hmm. And there are reports about potential reinfections, despite the people supposedly being immune. What are we to make of that? Well, um, I think the reports so far, they don't imply that people got reinfection despite of being, in, uh, of being immune. They imply only that tests or detection of virus was possible after people have recovered. And that is yet another thing. So not necessarily does a person that recovers or that has, has had a negative test result in the virus detection necessarily have immunity for reinfection, or it doesn't also mean that the contrary is the case. So we need to look into that in more, in more depth. We need to look at the antibody detection of those patients. And then we need to also see whether those patients who had re-identification and detection of pathogens who actually got ill or were just carriers of the pathogen. We know from many other diseases that people may be carriers of a disease or of a pathogen without actually falling ill. Huh. Is there a way to determine how long immunity will last in terms of SARS-CoV-2? I'm afraid the only way there is, is time. We need to look at the patients who have had the disease at one point in time, from which we have antibodies from a given point in time, and then we have to wait and look into the future whether there are cases among those who do get the disease again. Now, your institution wants to conduct antibody testing similar uh, to the one we've seen in the report, but on a much larger scale. What do you hope to show by doing that? So, uh, while the colleagues in Heimberg have done a very important study with a very specific focus in a very exclusive locality, we try to do a number of studies at different time points and in different localities in the country in order to give a better reflection on the immunity level in the overall population, but also on the change of that immunity level over time. And by that, we hope to be guiding politics and policy makers and decision makers on how to adjust the interventions in the fight against the pandemic. Gerard Krause of the Helmholtz Center for Infection Research, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. You're very welcome. And now to a staple segment in our show. You send us your questions about the coronavirus, we try to answer them. And the man hard at work in doing so is our science editor, Derek Williams. I get asked this a lot. It's, it's something that worries people. Let's put it this way. There's no evidence so far suggesting that takeout or takeaway food contributes in any way to COVID-19 transmission. There are no reported cases that have been linked to food. There aren't any full-blown studies yet on COVID-19, but there have been some similar studies on this topic with other coronaviruses, and they show that transmission in those pathogens doesn't really happen via the digestive tract. In the first stages of the infection, at least, coronaviruses in general invade the cells in the upper respiratory tract. SARS-CoV-2 also often appears to gain its first foothold in the nose, which food doesn't enter, of course. Um, viruses that are swallowed in food end up in the digestive tract and are eventually killed by the acid in your stomach. So as far as we can tell, 
Takeaway food doesn't present a danger. Packaging probably presents slightly more of one. That's why many experts also say if you want to be extra safe, you can transfer takeout food to your own household dishes, dispose of the containers quickly, and of course then wash your hands thoroughly. We still don't know everything there is to know about the transmission of SARS-CoV-2, but we're learning all the time. And as far as we can tell, there's no way to get COVID-19 from drinking water. Um, the WHO says there's no evidence about the survival of the virus in either potable water or sewage, and other coronaviruses are not transmitted this way. SARS-CoV-2 is actually what's called an enveloped virus, which means it has a quite fragile membrane that doesn't protect it all that long outside the body. Standard treatment methods used in most municipal drinking water systems like filtration and, and disinfection should inactivate it, just like they do other pathogens. If you live somewhere where you don't have access to safe treated drinking water, then the precautions that you've always taken to protect yourself, like boiling your drinking water, should also inactivate any coronavirus. I can't really give any correct advice here, as buying food is so different from country to country and, and from culture to culture. But speaking for myself in the coronavirus age, going to the grocery store has turned into a pretty nerve wracking experience. It's, it's really hard, I find, to keep the proper minimum distance away from other shoppers, even if the stores like here in Germany are limiting the number of customers allowed in at any given time. Um, in general, though, Many experts are saying it's best to buy big when you do go shopping, as going to the store less often limits your exposure to a potentially contagious environment. But if you are going on a big shopping trip, it's good to restrain the urge to fear buy huge amounts of basic necessities like toilet paper. Try to strike the right balance between meeting your own needs and respecting the needs of others. We're all in this together.